Well, the first thing is to listen to a lot of jazz. Um, it's really a language. And if you're not putting jazz language into your ears, it's not going to come out of your instrument. As with all my interviews, it's just two musicians hanging out talking about stuff. Jocelyn and an I talk about her winning a Juno Award and how she became the head of a jazz department so quickly. And she also mentions the thirds rule of learning in which I think is something that you should stick around to hear. I was also curious to hear from a women's point of view what it's like being a woman in a still male dominated industry. I also ask her what her biggest musical influence is. Her answer, may surprise you. I'm really excited about my guest. Originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba, she has hit the ground running ever since she placed first in the Wilson Center International Jazz Guitar Competition in 2018. Not only is she a fellow Canadian, but she is now the head of the guitar department at my old alma mater, Humber College in Toronto. She is absolutely a great player and also has an infectious smile. Jocelyn Gold, welcome to my channel and thanks for slotting me into your busy schedule and doing this interview. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so glad it worked out. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Techno <laughs> technological issues. <laughs> well, I'm really glad. Yeah. yeah. You even won a Juno, I was reading. And for non-Canadians, that's the equivalent of winning a Grammy. When was that? That was, let's talk a little bit about that. Yes, that was 2021. So a couple of years ago now, um, just coming out of, it was actually my debut album. And um, this album came out on March 20th, 2020. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right when shutdown happened, at least here in New York anyway. <laughs> not the greatest time to be releasing your first album mm -hmm. uh, so I was sort of like oh well whatever better luck next time <laughs> kind of thing. like just with the whole process right. um so you must then, have been like simply amazed when you're like what <laughs> totally yeah it was completely unexpected <laughs> I had just moved back to Canada too so I was like not really super known here um, so it was, yeah, really exciting. Very, very cool. Yeah. And then when you say move back, I'm assuming you were living in the States because I know you were living in New York actually for a little while. It wasn't that long. I don't think. Yeah. I went to school at Michigan state. Um, so did that and then went to New York after that. Right. And then up to Toronto for the, when I started teaching. Yeah. How, how did you get that position? Like, um, um, it seems like, uh, like, I didn't know that even, I remember hearing that Ted Quinlan was going to retire or whatever. And as next thing you know, boom, you've got the job. And I guess it was all happening behind the scenes or whatever. And Yeah, it was actually a kind of a, it's a funny story. Um, I was in New York, living in New York, and I was at this um, guitar festival that Saul Rubin put together in okay. Ibeka. Um, he like has all these great, he's done it a number of times and he has all these incredible guitarists play and then like younger cats, he puts on the list so they can just go hang and it's this whole hang. And, um, I was there and there was a session at the end of the night. So everyone was kind of playing and, um, I started talking to someone who had been playing. So a good, a guitar player. And we chatted for a bit. And after a while, he was like, yeah, I'm actually the dean of Humber College. <laughs> um, wow. So, so I met him at a jam session in New York. Um, and then I got a phone call like a couple months later saying um, that Ted was retiring. And so the position was open if I was interested in applying, um, which was not on my radar at all. I was like totally happy in New York. I didn't really. You were kind um, of just thinking, okay, I'm going to be working my goal towards playing, maybe recording, getting together with people, 
maybe being a sideman in a band or a leader or something, right? Yeah, I was not applying for jobs. I was not. It was just not what I was doing. Um, but I spoke to a few of my mentors and they were like, just apply. You don't like there's no harm in applying. Um, and I got offered the job and decided to to take it. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yes. <clears throat> yeah, I, yes. I always thought myself that I would probably end up back at Humber at some point teaching myself, but it never did work out because I ended up staying in the States and yeah. Um, yeah. And and it that kind of gig seems like a lot of responsibility, right? It's a lot of responsibility. And actually I haven't this is like totally brand new news. Um I haven't, you know, announced I I have yeah, no one knows yet, but this is actually my last term doing the job. Okay. I've just I've decided to uh, to go back to touring. I have a very, very full 2024 and things are just going super great on that front. So I, right. uh, I'm well, just kind of dive. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask you about. How do you manage to do a full-time professorship? And it's not only just a professorship, but I mean, you're you're the head of the guitar department. So like I said, that, that takes up a lot of time and, and uh, effort. And, you know, I've noticed a lot that you're traveling more and more all the time and, and not just in North America either. So I was going to yeah. say, like, either you're really good at time management or one of the things has to be suffering. <laughs> well, I am really good at time management. Okay. Um, well, maybe, never... maybe let's do a lesson on that. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Um, yeah, I've loved teaching. I've loved, you know, getting to know Toronto a little bit and um, getting to know the students and the amazing faculty. Um, and it's, you know, been really great. It has been a lot <laughs> to be like, uh, ba you know, it basically my schedule has been teaching in Toronto during the week and then like flying somewhere in the world for the weekend. Um, whether it's, you know, the Middle East or Europe or the West Coast or, you know, so it's been, um, I'm definitely feeling a little burnt out after. I was a few just going to, I was going to ask you, I had it written down here. When do you have time to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Very little. I skip a right. lot of nights sleep right now so i'm i'm uh yeah just taking it saying you know saying goodbye to full-time teaching just for now i love teaching right. and I, I will love to go back to it at some point but for now i just want to be on the road and playing and just out there so that would be what three years you were doing that four and totally a half five, four and a half oh, has it been since yeah. okay yeah cool um yeah and I know there there was a big changeover in faculty at around the same time that you took over. I I think because a lot of a lot of the same teachers that were there when I was there were kind of still there. Not all of them, but like I, yeah. <clears throat> yes. When I, when I was there, Pat Pat uh, LaBarbera was still teaching there. I don't I don't think he is anymore. No, him and Ted retired at the same time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't, didn't get to cross paths with Pad, which is sad. Right. And I, when I went to Humber, that was even before Ted was, Ted took over. I came right before COVID. So even like, it wasn't until, you know, 2021 that I actually started to get to know Toronto at all, because I went home to Winnipeg for the whole pandemic. Um, and, and you just kind of did remote stuff. Yeah, we did an entire year and a half of completely. Wow. Welcome to your first teaching gig and it's remote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, so I, um, I missed getting to know some great people, but hopefully in the future. Well, I hope, um, the, the music department at, 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 uh, Humber, is in a good position because I just heard that Mohawk closed down their music department altogether. So I hope that that's not a sign of the times kind of thing. 
Although I would, Im I just can't help but think that Humber is in a much better position. Yeah, I, I sure hope so. Yeah, <laughs> that's all over. Like it's a, it's a global thing. That I know. Yeah, like I just, just a couple of years ago, Laurentian University in Sudbury did the same thing. Mm. No more music department there. That is so sad. <clears throat> Because I remember in 2016 doing a master class there, mm -hmm. and then I was going to reach out again, and then the person that was kind of running it was like, "No, it's not a thing anymore." <laughs> oh, that's so sad. And you hear about high school programs being cut, like K to 12 programs being cut. It's just so tragic. Right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. It's. Uh, and hum and it's like I said, the music program has grown so much at Humber since when I was there. It was a much smaller program, and there was certainly no string department or anything like that. I think there's like violin and cello and stuff like that there now, but that never used to be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, you can. And it was and it was only a three year program when I went there. Oh, okay. I think when it became a bachelor program, it became a lot more. Um, you know possible for people a lot of a lot of young people want bachelor's degrees right yeah i think well, what yeah. i did was i eventually went back to humber to pick up a few more classes to, in order to get the bachelor degree because nice. i i wanted to get my master's degree and then we both have a michigan connection i went to western michigan university to do a master's do you know uh who do i know who went there no it might not be the right time actually okay. well, what so years i went there from 2007 to 2009. oh okay different time different okay. time never <laughs> someone after that or before probably before like i know a couple people who went in the 90s oh okay yeah yeah no i i went i went to uh western much later in life like i was 40 when i went there wow <laughs> very cool that's so cool yeah and then uh and then I, my my I, idea was to get a job teaching even if it was just part-time at a university or college but i've yet to procure such a a, a gig <laughs> yeah it's, it's just hard to get it i mean I, I i think mostly when i moved to new york right afterwards so i just don't know anybody in higher education here yeah. and that's kind of where you need to know some people yeah and it's really hard as a guitar player most guitar positions are adjunct there's very very few full-time guitar right. positions yeah out there um that's just the way the way it goes i guess in canada there's only like two i think two or th maybe three like a couple a few at the most in you, the whole and you have it one of them <laughs> well, <laughs> right or, or well, not any, not too much longer, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. For for the women and guys thinking about learning jazz, I know. Um, well, let's actually, you know what? Let's step back before we get into anything. Before, let's step back and found, find out how you got started in music. Yeah. So I was a a musical kid. I loved singing from a very young age. From you know, by the time as soon as I could talk, I was singing. Um, and my parents were both hobbyist guitar players. So I just, as a kid, I had this kind of insatiable passion for music and taking part in music and making music with, with other people. And um, That's the key right there is making music with other people. I picked up guitar when I was 13. My older brother showed me how to play power chords on the, uh, just some power chords so I could accompany myself singing. And I got completely hooked. I, you know, started practicing many hours a day, not out of any sense of, um, you know, of discipline, but just out of like passion, I guess. It, yeah, I, it, I remember those days too. Yeah, yes. Um, and I, I, didn't, I didn't study. I didn't take lessons. Um, I wasn't in, I didn't like play guitar in a school band or anything like that. 
Um, and after I graduated high school, I went into science and did three years of a science degree. Wow. And after it was in my, you know, second, third year of science, I was about 20. Well, I was, I was 20. Um, I, a couple of my friends um, had joined this brand new jazz program at the University of Manitoba, which is where I was studying. And I started going to their jam sessions and kind of just everything, you know, as soon as I saw what was going on with jazz music, which I hadn't grown up with, I knew I wanted to learn how to do how to do what they were doing at these sessions. So I started taking lessons and auditioned and uh, got into school and the rest kind of went from there. Were, were you taking lessons from someone that was teaching at the at the university? Um, I was. I did take a couple before I auditioned. I was taking lessons from a, a local guitar player. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I was kind of the same way. I I uh, I did start taking lessons right from day one, though. Uh, I, nice. I was seven. You were seven. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's unusual, I feel. And then by the time I was 12, I was playing professionally. What? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> that's I, not, that's atypical. Well, I remember, you know, probably other people have heard this story before, but I remember marching into my parents' bedroom one morning at, at age 11 saying, I, that's it. I've decided I'm going to be a professional guitarist. That's it. I've made up my mind. And the next thing I know, the next year, I'm in the musicians union doing gigs. You're kidding. Not really by my own design. It just happened that way. Like getting together with neighborhood kids and just jamming on stuff. Um, could be like, I got started playing country music. Okay. As, as my, um, the band leader said, the only two types of music that's any good, country and Western. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, you know, he her overheard me jamming with the neighborhood kids. And then one of the neighborhood kids was his son. And he decided, hmm, maybe I'll come out of like retirement. And he was like a semi professional musician. Uh, and <clears throat> I'll use these kids as my band. So that's how we got started. Amazing. That's incredible. And we never ever rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We we what? just I just learned the songs on the gig, which was really good for the ear, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And then cool. he also then he also with and within about a year, he's like, okay, he sets up a mic in front of me and goes, Okay, well, there's a mic, start singing now. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I had to learn how to sing harmony like on on the bandstand. There was no like figuring it out beforehand it just had to like use my ear that's amazing that's an incredible story yeah it, it, i never ever thought it was that strange it was just what i did yeah and, <laughs> and uh um so cool. Yeah, learn so, cool like yeah. teenage yeah and then um then i uh got into um the sort of more rock side of things like ZZ Top uh, was a, a was something that I'm, I'm thinking I'm remembering and then then I heard Van Halen <laughs> and then I really got into doing that kind of thing um, cool. and then I remember him talking about in an interview because he was really into Alan Holdsworth a lot was okay. influenced by so then I went well if he thinks Alan Holdsworth is is the shit then i better like listen to alan holdsworth so oh, I, I i got some alan holdsworth and then when i picked my jaw up off the off the floor i went oh my god there's so much more to learn about music so that's how i ended up going to humber to study jazz no jazz background like you at all ever that's amazing i just, I just went in kind of cold yeah yeah <laughs> incredible incredible that is very, very cool. And 
and it worked and that and you have been doing it for decades yeah yeah That's maybe, maybe to my parents chagrin <laughs> actually they've been very supportive i shouldn't say, i i they they've uh they've always been very supportive of what i do great uh, um so for the women and guys thinking about learning jazz what are yes. some of the things at the top of your list that one should probably do right away well, the first thing is to listen to a lot of jazz. Um, it's really a language. And if you're not putting jazz language into your ears, it's not going to come out of your instrument. So I had a teacher who told me early on, and I thought this was really, really great advice, that I should split up my practicing or my studying time um, into a third practicing, a third just, you know, by myself in the practice room, working on whatever routine it is that I have at that time, a third playing with other people. Um, this is, you know, the another huge thing. You can't learn how to play group improvised music by yourself in a practice room. That's, you know, not, not the best way to get from A to B at all. Um, so a third in the practice room, a third playing, um, and a third listening. So if you have three hours a day, divide it an hour, an hour, an hour. And this was advice that was given to me when I was younger. And I, looking back, um, I think that's, that's really great advice. Play with other people. Just get out there and play. It doesn't matter. Like you have to, you have to kind of be not great for a long time before you um, start to kind of understand what's going on. That, that time of not really feeling like you're making it kind of has to be put in. Right. Um, and listen, 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 listen. Yeah, I, I, I tell people basically the same thing. Maybe I like the thir thirds idea. That's that's great. But you certainly can't learn jazz in the bedroom by yourself. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, you got like, I mean, I did have lots of before I went to Humber, lots of stage time playing with people. Yeah. And I actually didn't. I was very uh, ig ignorant. <laughs> like, I mean, in, in the true sense of the word, I just didn't know any better. Yeah. And I thought everybody improvised all the time. I didn't, uh, I didn't know that I was supposed to learn the solo that was on the recording and then play that every night. I always made up my own stuff all the time. Very cool. <laughs> I, I was just always improvising and didn't know it. Like yeah. I, I just, even though I didn't have a word for it, I just thought that that's what people did. Yes. Anything yeah. that anything that made it to a recording, it didn't matter if it was a Johnny Cash recording or a Willie Nelson recording, whatever. I didn't know it was parts that were probably somewhat worked out, you know, ahead of time to a, to a certain extent. And then the the musicians that were on tour played those same solos every night or whatever. I did, I had no idea. Right. I, I just assumed that well, if that got put on tape that day then I better come up with something really good every time I play too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And absolutely. then that's why I think partly why I was so, uh, sort of found jazz fascinating because I felt at home as, as the far as the, uh, improvising goes, but like you were saying, it's a whole different language. I figured, well, once I learn the language then, and once I feel comfortable with it, then I'll be okay. Totally. In yes. A, in a, in, with, without a calculating way of planning it out or thinking of it that way, I think intuitively I knew that. That is very, very cool. And That's like, a... like you said, you, um, you know, you, <laughs> you have to be playing with people, uh, yeah. in order to, and, and be, and be able to be happy with or being okay with sucking really badly for a while. Yes. I, I kind of, I kind of liken it to, um, learning how to be a, 
a stand-up comic. Like when you first do it, you're probably going to bomb over and over and over again until you finally figure out how to make it work. Yeah, yes. And I think there are improvisatory qualities to stand up as well. So I think these types of art that are really um, less about, um, they're more, they're very in the moment um, and can take twists and turns. I just don't think it's possible to start, to start great. (laughs) I don't like, can't. Well, I always tell my students, I say, well, even Mozart had to practice. Of course. Right. <laughs> Everybody has to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I'm 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 I have to say I I'm really excited to have you uh because like a lot of my uh YouTube interviews, even though it's changing, um my channel's been very male centric. <laughs> so I'm I'm really happy to have a female on on board. Oh, um, well, I'm happy here yeah the the de- the the demographic has changed on my channel and uh you know i i wanted to reflect that representation a little more because at first when my fir- channel first started it was like all male like no females would show up and now there's certainly more females so i and i've always wanted to uh do something that uh showcases some more females because i've always i've always said that the music business has always been out of balance with more testosterone than estrogen (laughs) so so uh that's great um do you feel that things have changed or come a long way in in that sense it seems like to me it has but but i wanted to get your perspective as a woman yes um i'm feeling uh, I mean, I think it's um, um, a very big subject that yeah. we could talk about, you know. We only could almost do a whole podcast just on that or something, right? Just on gender dynamics in yeah. music. Um, um, I think that there are a lot of positive changes that I've seen since since I you know, started um, trying to learn jazz guitar. I'm seeing a lot more young women um, wanting to learn how to play. And um, I guess if, I guess I feel like those young women have always been there. Guitar is awesome and everybody wants to play it um not just one gender that happens to want to play this amazing instrument um i think the avenues the resources have not always been there for young women um and i'm seeing a lot more resources being made available a lot more women teachers um women you know heads of guitar departments right just a lot more role models a lot more space being made for young women and gender diverse musicians who want to learn the instrument so i think now it's it's um it's i mean i would like to think that it's not that there's more more young women and gender diverse people who would like to play i think that now it's just that the the resources are starting to be there that we can start to see them and they can grow and learn that's that's what i i that's what i was hoping your your take would be or like have a little bit of insight on that that um do have you ever experienced anything weird like i hope this isn't a a delicate (laughs) topic for you or anything but (laughs) is have you ever experienced any kind of weird stuff like with, with a male dominated kind of seemingly still thing going on in the world of jazz or music at all? Yeah, I mean, I think you'd be hard pressed to find um, to find someone who hasn't experienced, you know, who who hasn't um, had experiences that they feel have been a certain way because of their gender. Um, It's hard it's hard to ever, you know. Um, it's hard to analyze it, right? When, when yeah. even if it's, I, I would imagine even if it's like, 
you felt a little tinge of it or something or like it's hard to I'm sure it's hard to like really pinpoint or like oh or like oh yeah see that a thing that happened right there that might be like yeah there are you know things that it's like very clear and um obvious in the moment right. what, what's going on and then there are always I think even tougher for me sometimes are those are those things you look back on years later and you you'll just never really quite know what was going on um right. you kind of you can you can never really know oh would, would I have been you know treated treated a little bit differently in this situation if um you know there had been more women in the room for example or right. would I have you know, been considered for this opportunity um, if it weren't, you know, for the for gender disparity. Um, you can never really you just have an idea. You just kind of end up going off of an of an idea, um, except for some situations where you're like, this is a very gendered situation. Yeah, with me, I mean, I, I always hoped it would be just uh, on the merit of, of how the person can play or can they play or not <laughs> that's really really it should come down whether you're neither, neither female or, or male or whatever however you express your your gender or whatever um it should come down to that and in order for it to come down to that we need to provide equal access to learning for um because right now i think um um if we cut out young women because they can't play yet, then we're just continuing a problem. Um, right. Yeah. Cause there, I'm, there needs to be a little bit of catch up time. I'm sure because if, if they're being held back for whatever reason and, and not presented with the, the same opportunities. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think presenting, presenting the same resources to anyone who wants to learn the instrument is something that we're still, um, still that still needs a lot of work what's it like for enrollment right now like at humber because mm -hmm. when, when i went to humber there was one girl in the guitar department and that was it yeah how many students were in the guitar department when you went to humber maybe 20. okay so about five percent then um well how many guitars are in the, in the uh in in the uh the music department now when I started in 2019, it was about 80. Wow. Oh my <laughs> God. It really has grown then. Wow. That's um, crazy. I think, okay. I, I, I think he would let 25 people in and then it probably, it usually got whittled down to about 20 people because five people would quit or whatever. And technically that's how I got in is that, um, I auditioned really, really late and he's like, well, I don't have room for you. So, so I wrote a letter saying, you know, expressing how badly I wanted to get in and that I would work really, really hard. And if there's ever a spot that opens up, please consider me. And, they, and that's exactly what happened. So, <laughs> Oh, that's cool. That's very cool that you did that, that you took it upon yourself to, to write that letter. Back to the, uh, the, the ratio maybe of mm -hmm. male to female yeah. Least, let's, let's start with guitarists. I mean, not necessarily the whole school, because yeah. there was at least when I went to school, most of the vocalists were were female. Yes. And, um, mm -hmm. and and then like, I I don't remember one bass player. There might have been, but like one guitar player when I went to school. Uh, and unfortunately, I witnessed like a lot of. Uh, trouble that she went through being a female like, like a lot of people were giving her a hard time and i don't think she even lasted uh maybe a year and a half before she quit which is really sad it is it is very sad i see a lot of um and i think it's the most res like i admire it i admire when people choose to leave situations that are not um that are not good for them. I don't think that, you know, people should be, the young young women should be um, forcing themselves to be in situations that aren't 
positive. Yeah, I uh, hope that it didn't cause her to quit doing music. I really hope she either found another school or a situation mm -hmm. that worked out for her. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think mm -hmm. there was like maybe one piano player that was female at the time, one or two. But then again, it was uh, when I went there, it was a lot of teachers from that were still there from the, when the school started the music program, 70s, uh, you know, oh. from this, so maybe their thinking was a little bit different, too. And maybe they didn't admit as many females. I'm I'm sure that yeah. across the board um, with every decade, you know, things yeah. are changing area. Yeah. So I can't imagine what the 70s would have been like. <laughs> yeah, I, I I wouldn't know because I wasn't there in the seventies. But uh, yeah. um, like I said, not till late eighties, mid to late eighties. Yeah, um, yeah. Who would you say is your biggest influences, musically or otherwise? It doesn't even have to be necessarily musically. Yeah, my biggest influence is my uh, my guitar teacher from Michigan State University. Um, his name's Randy Napoleon. And when I moved to Michigan and started studying with him, I really, um, that was when I started to come in to my own as a, as a guitar player and really start to, um, to develop, I think at a pretty good, like at a, a, a rate that I was happy with, um, He's a wonderful, amazing teacher. We still talk all the time. He actually just came out to the West Coast with me to play some gigs in Portland and Vancouver uh, about a month ago. Cool. Some two guitar, two guitar stuff. And yeah, I really look up to his playing. Um, and I look up to his professionalism and the way he commits himself to lifelong learning. Um, yeah, so I would say he's my my biggest influence. Oh, cool. That's that's great, and it mu must speak volumes on his uh, teaching ability too. Because some, I think, some teachers have a, a maybe it's because it got passed passed down to them is like throwing certain things at people to use as benchmarks or whatever instead of just basic information and then learn how to discover your own voice and put your your own self into it at least that's how i'm reading what you're saying I, I could be wrong but yeah i think for me just the the uh, the idea that this is um a lifelong development um and as you know this is not something that I have to wake up and beat myself up about because I'm not, you know, playing my scales cleaner or I'm not, you know, I don't know as many tunes as I think I should know or any, anything like that. It's really yeah. more about. Yeah. You can the, never learn, know enough tunes. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. It's much more about just putting your best foot forward consistently and um and give her yeah, <laughs> as, as, as a canadian term <laughs> totally. I, I just got back from from touring myself um ah. and, and uh that was a term that i because i brought some new york musicians with me that are that are from the u.s so i i, I schooled them on the the term giver <laughs> you just got a giver <laughs> totally yeah that's pretty central canadian too that's like it, that's like regional probably, yeah well I, I grew up in northern ontario so there you go that's yeah, yeah that's uh yes we know about giving her <laughs> <laughs> um you'll ha okay so i know you've been over to uh europe and and england and stuff you <laughs> have to talk about being a guest on that pedal show <laughs> I don't think the your episode or whatever has aired yet, right? No, it hasn't. So, so maybe you can't talk too much about it, but whatever you can, it, it'd be. Uh, I, I'd like to sort of uh, find out, like, how you maybe got on the channel, or did they reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? 
Yeah, they, we have been in touch for years, actually. Dan reached out to me in 2020 and said, if you're ever in the UK, we would love to have you on on the show. And um, Dan is a big fan of jazz guitar. Um, and I had never been to the UK until a couple of weeks ago. So I um, let them know that I was going to be in in their area and we set it up and they're beautiful cats, Mick and Dan there. It was just a really, really nice afternoon. We, um, yeah, hung out, played some guitar, talked about guitar, um, drank some coffee <laughs> Yeah, and it was lovely. It was really lovely. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm thinking like that, that you're not really known as a pedal kind of person. Yeah. So was it, was it mostly like you're, I would tend to think you're just uh, a cable into the amp from the guitar kind of, kind of gal. <laughs> I am. Yes, I am. So we talked a lot about like how I generate sound out of the instrument um, techniques, how to get a sound out of an arch top guitar, like very arch top specific. Right. Cause um, that's an, a, probably a, a thing that a lot of people that watch their channel probably aren't privy to is an arch top point of view there's a lot to know that's very specific to that instrument um yeah so we talked about that we talked about improvising a little bit and um yeah all sorts of stuff nice yes, yeah, I, yeah. I i always uh kind of um imagine myself being on that show too at one point um but very uh, yeah. Very so when when I when I saw your Instagram post about that, I was like, "Oh wow, cool!" <laughs> oh, that's um, awesome. Now, let maybe look. We could maybe since we talked about that show, is gear outside of your guitar itself that important to you? So I mean, I would imagine for you, like the guitar is the first important thing, right? Yeah. So. Um, I don't have the luxury of getting to bring like usually it's just me usually um, with my instrument. And, you know, I don't really get to bring a lot more when I'm on the road. So I have to be sort of ready to try and make any amp sound as good as I can. Um, so I really focus on the instrument itself, how can I get a good sound out of the instrument? Um, and um, of course, you know, I would love to, to be able to bring my own amplifiers places, but I, you know, that's just not, not the way it works yeah. for me. So. <laughs> yeah. Cause if you're doing a lot of fly dates, it's hard, unless you're driving, you can't really bring, your own yeah aim. yes so i'm very focused on just like i want my skill set to be that i can make anything work right um, um which ends up coming a lot back to how like actually how i'm playing the instrument right and uh how to set up the an amp hopefully that actually works is not crackling all over the place every time you try to play a note into it yeah, like just yeah. set it up in a in a sort of generic way that still going to have your sound to come through. I would imagine, right? Yeah, Cause, yes. Because that's a specific art in itself. I'm sure that you're learning is like, how do I make any amp work? Totally, totally. So I usually just start with no EQ at all, um, and then before a gig, I need some time just to like get to know what's what's going on and um i have a very specific sound in my mind that i'm looking for um so no matter what i'm i'm no matter what kind of room i'm in no matter what kind of amp i'm using i just need to get as close to the sounds that i'm hearing in my like my best sound right well n i didn't write this down but I was going to say, what does good tone mean to you? And you kind of already started what I believe is at first it has to start in your mind first. 
<laughs> you have to have something to that you want to sound like first. Yeah, yes, I agree. It's almost like you're I'm always kind of chasing every now and again the stars just kind of align and my sound is just right and it might just be the way I'm playing that day, the way I'm like physically playing the instrument. Um, there's so many factors. It's the room. It's because one amp will sound completely different in a room one day than a different room in another day. Totally, totally. It's um, where the mic is placed on it. If they're miking it up, like all those things are huge factors. Yeah. Yeah. Very climate related. The, mm -hmm. um, you know, I end up in a lot of different climates. Um, and since it's a piece of wood, it expands and contracts and does all sorts of, of, you know, wacky things <laughs> from right. flight to flight. So when I take it out of its case after a flight, you know, you just, you never know. You never know. <laughs> I like, I like that Jim Hall quote where, where he's, he says, uh, sometimes I lift up the guitar case and the guitar says, not today, Jim. <laughs> I love that. I'm, yeah. That's very funny. It's um, true. What yeah. it is, is some kind of something, some kind of, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The, sometimes the guitar blesses you one day and says, yeah, I feel like being played. And other days is like, get, get off of me. <laughs> totally. Yes. Yeah, totally. It's so, it's so weird. It's, it's really hard to explain to someone who doesn't play. It's very hard to explain. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then, um, yeah so that's that's what i'm i have a naturally a very bright sound just that's the sound that just comes out of this of instruments when i play them um so i'm very cognizant of that i some people like it but you know you're always like you, you're picky about you have like qualms with your own playing that are just you kind of being crazy um yeah. but that I, no one else cares about other than you yeah no one cares at all, but I tend to think my playing is too bright. So I'm usually trying to trying to figure that out without losing kind of the, you know, sparkle that you, that you can get. I don't know. It's such a yeah. thing. You know, yeah. we're all just. I, I'm, I tend to be definitely more on the dark side, Okay. <laughs> like more of a really dark round tone. With yeah, just, just a little sprinkling of, you know, some treble on top, just enough to, like, I kind of right. liken it to like icing on a cake, just to sweeten it a little bit. Yeah. That's if it. you can dial it in right. Yeah. Totally. Now, I was now because we were, I was driving on tour, I was able to bring my own amps. Nice. And, and I've just started to go to a two amp setup, which, mm. I, which would have, which would probably be a good topic on that pedal show because I've got like a wet dry scenario. Mm. Very so I, cool. I have reverb and delay that goes to just one amp very and all cool. the dry effects going to a different amp. That is very cool. And it gets, it gets split it up like, um, like kind of like in the studio when they, when they, do a parallel mix of, of reverb and whatever. So mm -hmm. you're not affecting the whole tone. So it's very... being mixed in parallel and then sent to just one amp. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. And I, and I, I have a fairly extensive pedal board for a jazz guy. Like a lot of people say that, but you know, uh, the kind of stuff that I do because it's a trio, I am almost always playing in a trio situation. I need, I want to fill out some sound. A little bit yeah and even though i'm i'm definitely influenced by bebop postmodern bebop kind of influence it's definitely more on the modern side for sure and yeah. i've got pedals that give me like a b3 organ sound if i can combine the two pedals you know because i what happens is i write a song and i'm like okay this needs an organ sound so next thing you know <laughs> you have to buy a new pedal to make it work so that's how right. that kind of works out yeah. And, yeah. Then, I, and then it looked like you were going to have a question about the wet dry or something. Oh, I was just wondering where you were touring recently. Oh, uh, started in uh, Michigan. Ah. Um, 
I pl- I did a master class with uh, the the guys that I took with me at uh, Michigan Tech University, which is in Houghton, Michigan, oh, cool. on, on the U- in the UP. And Very then we cool. did a concert that night, and then it started uh, there. Then I went into Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, spent four days doing different things there. Um, then uh, Sudbury. Nice. And I think, I think you're going to be playing at the same place coming up soon, at the Night Owl. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. What's it like? I've never been. It's a really, really tiny room. <laughs> really <laughs> tiny. Like, it's really, like, it reminds, well, you lived in New York. It's like, playing in some new york places very cool really Uh, small like if if the place was completely full there maybe would be room for 30 35 people maybe okay very cool 40 people something like that very cool but there the people were really 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 nice and and uh matter of fact everywhere we went people were like wow you guys were amazing (laughs) which is like that's never really happened before. People are Aww. like, you know, well, ever that's cool. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but but also, this is the first time I took some New York musicians with me too. So ah, so, very so, cool. So we so we were just giving her. <laughs> I <know> the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what cool. kind of gear are you using? Like, what, if you like, maybe when you're playing locally in Toronto, what's mm. your favorite amp or what's your favorite setup? Yeah, well, the only amp I actually have here is uh, a Henriksen. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the only the only amp I have here. I have a Deluxe Reverb and another Henriksen in Winnipeg. Okay. Uh, so you don't have my... to. Travel yeah. With it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's where my house is. I have a house in Winnipeg. Um, and yeah, I'm. I love you know like old Fenders um that's but i'm you know can't it's not that often that i get to use one yeah and i don't know if you can see it but i have a a fender Ah. basement behind me from the 60s it's a 66. cool and it's the first amp i played through when i was when i told you about when i was 12. whoa you have it still well it wasn't mine it was the the band leaders but i just got it like a few years ago when I went back to Canada to I just mentioned like what happened whatever happened to that amp anyway and and since he's deceased now his wife's still alive and she says she's like oh yeah it's down in the basement you can have it if you want it (laughs) (laughs) incredible so so yeah I just got it back before the tour um I didn't get a chance to get it fixed because it still had the two prong cable on it from the 60s Oh that, my. That, that you don't want to use because you might get electrocuted. Like I remember even when I was a kid stepping up to the mic and touching the mic and then boom, you got this big zap on the lip. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you, all of a sudden you're the ground. Whoa. That's <laughs> yeah. 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 That is so, so cool. Got it. That I know. Have- I know. And I, I, I haven't even got a really a chance to try it out yet because then oh, the tour, good. then the tour started and, do you, do you have any uh, sponsorships or anything like that? Yeah, well, I play a Benedetto. Um, so they're, they sponsor me. Um, okay. Benedetto artist. And that's it. That's good enough for now, right? <laughs> oh, that's great. Yes, I'm, I, love, I love their guitars. They're incredible. I, I've, I've never tried one out, I don't think. Uh, when I, I, I probably should have asked Pat Martino. I went to Pat Martino's house for a lesson one time wow and he had a whole bunch of his signature guitars laying around and i I probably should have asked him if i could have tried it out but yeah yeah wow but he he, um he has like either sometimes a 16 or sometimes as low as a 14 for his high e string right yeah Yeah. because he said he always he told me he's got like a really like aggressive right hand because he really hits the strings hard or yeah you know yes so. yeah i'll use always, yeah are you really okay for sure yeah oh you're the same way okay nice so yes <laughs> like you yeah. like to dig in right 
Absolutely, absolutely. I like using 12s, and then for the high EMB, I'll use like a 13s, 14s. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. I, I use a set of 12s myself okay. to mastic and felt um, uh, 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 like flat wounds. The swing Bebop. string, I think they call it. Yeah, the Bebop okay. one is the ones that are, are round wound. Those are rounds. That's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. I, I really like those strings. They 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 tend to keep their tone for a long time, um, That's very and they it works really good because I'm a fingerstyle guitarist. So, so I don't, I mean, and I like to use a little bit lighter string, um, and still get a nice tone out of it because I play fingerstyle. I'm not hitting it, the strings quite as hard. So that's very. why. That's why 12 works good for me. But with my guitar, I also have a high A, like a Lenny Bro setup. Oh, that, wow. <clears throat> so uh, if I go to uh, um, a, a, any bigger size of string, it kind of drowns out the high A string. Because like the, the, the smallest or the largest size I can do for the high A is an eight. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's very cool. I've uh, I've been playing that way since 2002, maybe something like that. Amazing! Wow, amazing! With the old thumb pick and everything. Very cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, Chet Atkins was was one of my first guitar heroes when I was a kid, and I I played with a thumb pick. Then I was sitting there, you know, trying to figure out his thing <laughs> when I was yeah. like a, about eleven or so, like off of my dad's record collection yeah yeah and, and uh and then i also played five string banjo too so I, the, the thumb pick wasn't a foreign thing to me but okay. it wasn't until years later after i watched uh his daughter's emily's um movie on on lenny bro yeah that i, that I kind of switched over and went all in <laughs> very cool yeah. very, very cool oh that's awesome. that's great well i i want to respect uh I want to be respectful of your time because I know you you've got to get going um, soon here. But can you um, maybe uh, talk about, or maybe even demonstrate if you have your guitar or something, uh, what yeah. makes your sound and style? Like, how do you approach learning and improvising jazz and all that stuff? Like, maybe a little bit of a mini lesson. Like, it might be hard to to narrow it down. Yeah. But what? What kind of makes Jocelyn sound like Jocelyn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm very, um, very particular about the sounds that I'm like drawing out of the instrument. Um, it has to be a very specific thing for me. So even the way that I hold the instrument. I was just going to say that I, I've noticed the way you hold it is so that the back doesn't get choked, right? Exactly, exactly. There's, um, for it's a big difference in how the sound comes out for for with with this guitar if i'm if i'm muting the the back of the instrument um with my body so i hold it in a specific way and also i do this just for posture and um i want to be you know playing forever so right. i don't and also it's very important to me to be able to look around at my band and look at the, into the audience and so sitting upright for me really kind of gives me a lot more freedom to be present in the room i used to play just so like uh you know right. kind of hunt over but I, um i think that's a very canadian thing too a lot of canadian jazz music guitarists i do that i think play kind of over their yeah. instrument yeah Interesting. I something didn't... that i've something that i've observed and mm -hmm. i i kind of found myself really doing that a lot and then tried to, you know, connect more with the musicians in the band and the audience as, when I moved to the U S <clears throat> an interesting observation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a big part of it for me too. Is just like, I don't want, like I used to have a sore back and now I don't have any of those problems, but it's also a lot just about technique. Um, so, so, for me, um, I play very much, I pick the string very much with the side of, of my pick yeah. rather than 
one and it's a pretty stark difference. This is a flat, total, just like uh, perpendicular to the string. Actually, we, I can't hear your guitar. Oh, well, maybe, maybe it'll be more of a talking thing than a demonstration thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is how I sit um, very specifically um, so that the sound can bounce off of the back piece of wood and come out of the instrument. And when, and I, I, when I studied flamenco guitar, there's a reason why they hold their guitar that way the same, for the same reason to get as much projection as possible because they, they do it on the, on the, that leg and it's, and it's not even touching their body at all. They're holding it just so it, it just, um, kind of balances there on its own, even yes. different than, even different than a classical guitarist. Totally. And classical guitarists too. And I've even considered like getting one of those guitar lifts. Yeah. I think they're cool. Um, um, and then I, I play, with the side of my pick so if you can see like this is a pick totally perpendicular to the string you're hitting it with a 90 degree angle yep and i and this doesn't work for everybody it's kind of depends on how flexible your thumb is and i have happened to have a, a very flexible thumb um but i tilt my pick up toward me oh, like that okay instead of down yeah you yeah yeah okay. some people put down um i tilt it up towards me and so you end up getting a totally different timbre um just from the the pick striking so, the whether it's way. slanted down or up like the way you do it um mm -hmm. when it's on the side you definitely get a thicker sound you don't yeah you don't, you don't get the what i refer to as like a tickety tack totally off, off to the tip yeah and totally. I, I do the same thing even with my thumb pick like i it's I've shaped it a certain way and I, it rolls off the string on an angle. Like I'm holding my, my thumb like this. Ah, very so, cool. So even if I was to like, just use my, my pick. It's, it's kind of got that downward motion. It's hard to see with the thumb pick cause my thumb's hiding the, the pick part, but yeah. Yeah. And then. Cool. I'm using my index finger as usually the upstroke. Very cool. Yeah. Very and I, I've really trained my, my, my right, or my right hand. Of course it's my right hand. <laughs> uh, my, my index finger uh, to play at the same volume as the, the pick, mm. but not mm -hmm. in a conscious way, just, from listening just make sure everything matches right but i cool. anyway not it's not about me i wanted to talk to you. yeah I just wanted to i wanted to uh find out more about you than me yeah so those are two kind of things i can demonstrate without playing okay uh, that i that i think about a lot and that's a and, little, almost more like the george benson uh type yeah of hand exactly position. yeah he is comes very much like from underneath. Yeah. Um, and my, I'm pretty similar to that. And I was taught by someone who, um, who, you know, said that who liked the way George George Benson approaches um, the right hand. So yeah. So that's that's how I do it. And I hybrid pick a lot too. So right. uh, all my solo guitar is hybrid pick comping. I do a lot of hybrid picking. Um, so uh, I use my pinky. <laughs> a lot of guitarists don't use their pinky. I do. It's yeah. like a blessing and a curse, mostly a curse, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I work on my right hand a lot for sound. It's a lot out of like how I'm bringing the sound out of the instrument. As far as the, uh, the hybrid approach, approach yeah did you get anything from say also canadian ed bickert did you get some of the, that idea from ed bickert at all or just something that you've just all figured out by yourself yeah i mean ed, ed bickert is is brilliant um i actually didn't really check him out until i moved to toronto because uh, <laughs> being being it being toronto yeah yeah yes so he actually didn't his playing didn't inform my playing but i loved I love the way he plays. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I yeah, it's too bad uh, we didn't get some sound because I, I I I wish you could just demonstrate like how you think about no no choices and 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 uh, yeah, how, and basically the set like that type of sound, not the s sound of the instrument, but the sound of what your no choices are when you play. Right, maybe, right. Maybe we'll have to be do a part two sometime. <laughs> Let's go hard too. Yeah. I would love well, that. Anyone in New York, I'll be doing, um, I'll be playing at Dizzy's on the January 4th, 5th, and 6th. So I'm starting my year out in, in New York. Oh, cool. Uh, so. What what days of the week are the, is that? Is that Friday, Saturday, Sunday kind of thing? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll be doing the late night sets there that weekend. Okay. Um, I'll end on. I'll try to make it out. Oh, cool. I'll be yeah. at Birdland on January 17th with Frank uh, Vignola. I won't be in Canada then, but <laughs> uh, very, I'll very try cool. to make it out to Dizzy's. Cool. I would yeah. love to see you. That would be great. It would be nice to finally meet. Yeah, yeah. That would be fantastic. And and do you have any albums out that you would want to let people yeah. know about or your website, anything? Yeah, my website, jocelyngould.com. Um, Jocelyn Gould Music uh, on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, also my YouTube channel. I'm um, about to start putting a lot more content on YouTube. So uh, my YouTube channel, um, my website for CDs. I've got uh, my CDs up there. And yeah, all the usual stuff. Awesome. Well, if you ever... Um, if, if the YouTube thing is a little bit new to you, if you want to reach out for some advice, I'll, I'd be happy to let you know what I know. <laughs> uh, thanks, yeah. Adam. Yeah, I no will worries. Thank you. I've had a couple people call me up before to, uh, to, to ask some questions because I've done it now for the last four years or so, and I've learned a lot. I still have a long way to go, but I've learned a lot. There's a lot to know. There is, yeah, for sure. Click on this interview I did with Adam Levy who played guitar for Nora Jones and Tracy Chapman. It's one of my favorite talks with another musician. Like we practice and practice and practice. And a lot of the stuff that people practice won't be very useful.